Make sure to subscribe to this channel at any time by clicking the subscribe button on the lower right hand portion of the video. May God bless as you listen to and enjoy this sermon. And just kind of pull, extrapolate a little deeper truth from the passage. Uh, it's very, it's kind of heady. you got to put your thinking caps on a little bit. And uh, you didn't need a whole lot of thinking this morning to get the message. If you, if you know about murmuring and disputing, you, you got the message. So uh, I think it's something we all, we all struggle with it. That's why it's in the Bible. But uh, this here will, will kind of give you a, a different perspective on the passage. And it is what I cut out of the sermon this morning, thinking I could give it to you tonight. Those of you that uh, came back. All right, Judges chapter 1 and verse 22. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to describe, that means to search out, describe means to search out. And the house of Joseph sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city. And they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and uh, all his family. Now that's something that's peculiar to your uh, King James Bible and to the Hebraic uh, language, that sometimes you'll see the verb before the, before the noun. So there's, we would say, you know, they, let, they let the man go. That's how we would say it, they let the man go. But notice how to preserve the Hebrew text, it says they let go the man. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, not that, it's not that complicated, but that's a Hebrewic uh, way of speaking that the King James translators preserved when they translated it over. So one of the things you get with your King James Bible is not just the preservation of God's words, though it is. It's the preservation of the Hebrew, Hebraic uh, language. Mm -hmm. That was the idea, is yeah. to uh, keep it intact even in English. Which is, which is why they say it's so hard to understand. That's because sometimes you have the verb before the noun, and you have the subject seemingly out of place. But it's not. It's just the way the Hebrews speak, and you're speaking it in English, and it's still intact, okay? Um, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built the city. Now look, and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. Now, what's interesting is a lot of us remember the spies going to Rahab's house. A lot of us remember about the spies that sought out Canaan, right? But here you have um, some spies. It doesn't say how many. It just says that um, the house of Joseph uh, was sent to describe Bethel. That is to search out Bethel. So the house of Joseph alone are the spies. And as these spies, they went out and they found a man uh, who belonged to this city called Bethel. That was before called Luz. And basically, they put him up at knife point, at gunpoint, if you will, and said, hey, you either die or you turn traitor on your country, on your people, and we'll let you live. And that's kind of what happened with the Rahab, is they said, if you will turn on Jericho, essentially, and save us, then we will spare you and we will spare your family. And she did that. She was spared. Now, what happened with Rahab was she became a part of, she became a, a, a proselyte to Judaism. She became part of um, the, the tribes of Judah there as they went into the Canaan land. Now this man here, when he was let go, it wasn't like he fell in line with the Hebrews, with the Jews. He went and started his own uh, land, his own city. So um, you can see here, you know, there's some similarities in that he was spared the Jews were spared, and the family of, of, this, of this man was spared. But this man, unlike Ahab, or un, unlike Rahab, did not choose to become a proselyte. He, cho he chose to go start a new city, and he took the name of the former city, a Gentile city in Luz, and he took that name and he brought it with him over into the land of the Hittites and then called that city Luz, okay? So that's kind of what you have going on there. Now, I told you that the word lose means twisted, turned aside, crooked, or perverse. Twisted, turned aside, crooked, or perverse. That's what lose means. L-U-Z or luz. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, but um, that 
that name there means twisted, turned aside, crooked, or perverse. The secondary meaning to that name is light, okay? And like I said, uh, luz, L-U-Z, is similar to L-U-X in Latin. L-U-X is found over there in Isaiah 14. Uh, the light bearer there, L-U-X, light, actually means more light or abundant light. And luz just means light. Now, if you don't know that in Latin, you know it in Spanish. Yeah. In Spanish, the word luz means light. And a lot of your Spanish comes from Latin. So you have that thing that makes its way over across dual languages, okay? And that's kind of a cool thing, and I think anyways. And um, so you have a dual application, which is what I preached about this morning, about how we can be a city of light, a city of luz, a city of light, in the midst of a crooked and perverse luz, crooked and perverse world, right? We can be a good city in the midst of a bad city, essentially, was this morning's sermon, without murmurings and disputings, without rebuke, holding forth the word of light, okay? Now... Why was this city originally, because remember, look at verse number 23. Notice how Bethel used to be called Luz. See that? Yeah. And the house of Joseph sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. So at some point, this city of Luz was turned to the name Bethel. Okay? Bethel. Now, why was this city called Luz? What's the reason for calling this city Luz? Why would you call your city a crooked city, a twisted city, a a turned aside city. Why would you name your city that? Well, I'll tell you the reason is in both regions, there's one tree that was predominantly found in that region. And it's a crooked tree, it's a twisted tree, and it's a tree that's turned aside. That tree is the almond tree. The almond tree. So in the original Luz and in the Luz Part 2 or 2.0, the reason why it was named that way, the reason why that guy probably took that name with him was there was almond trees found in both regions, okay? That's the reason. Maybe he brought some of those almond trees with him and transplanted them. I don't know. But the Bible doesn't say. But the reason why it was called that is because of the tree that was found there is the almond tree. And that's what I want to talk about tonight for a little while is the almond tree, all right? And how this is connected to Israel. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, look at verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. The almond tree has, just like the land of Luz has dual application, twisted, perverse, crooked, right? And light. The almond tree has two applications to it. One, the almond tree is a picture of God's righteousness. And secondarily, it has a picture of God's uh, judgment. The rod, of the rod of correction. So the almond tree is used to picture both God's righteousness and his judgment. Just like the land of Luz pictures light and darkness, if you will. Okay? Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. There we see a rod of an almond tree. In other words, they took this almond tree and they probably cut a branch out of it and then they carved it or whittled it down to it was a nice a rod that could be used uh, for uh, discipline, correction. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 5. Now notice the chapter number is 12 and the, chapter, and the verse number is 5. 12 is the number of Israel, 5 is the number of death, okay? 12 and 5, all right? Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. What you have here is a dual application about just man getting old, but also the nation of Israel here. Dual application. One about just man getting old, right? And forgetting things and breaking down. The teeth don't work. The ears don't work. You get all hunched over. You lose your memory. You lose your keys. That's the picture of Rome. That's what Ecclesiastes 12 is talking about in the natural sense. But in a very prophetical or doctrinal way, Ecclesiastes 12 is dealing with the nation of Israel. Okay? And verse 5 is the number of death. And the Bible says there that their almond tree is going to flourish 
but also that the grasshopper is going to be a burden. That is, that you're not going to be able to pick up things that you just used to pick up. In other words, you see like that thing that falls to the ground, and in your old age, you're like, that's not worth it. You don't want to pick up small things anymore. That's the idea. Uh, but the almond tree is going to flourish. You know, the hair is the hair is going to you know grow out all the places. Yeah, your hair and whiskers grow longer and longer. The ear hairs grow wider and wider. You know, that's the way I think. But the almond tree, the easy one says, the almond tree still flourish. Your fingernails still grow. That's when the thing works. And your nose is always getting bigger. Ear, ears are always getting bigger. Things continue to grow as you get older. Right. And it's hard to keep up with it, right? The care it takes to stay alive gets harder and harder to maintain. That's the whole idea, okay? So the almond tree is a picture both of God's righteousness and his judgment. But it's also a picture of God's goodness and Israel's rebellion. Okay, Israel's rebellion. All right, now. Go to Numbers chapter 17. So this almond tree is clearly connected to the nation of Israel. I mean, it's connected to all man, sure. But in the context, it's connected to the nation of Israel. Israel was both a righteous nation, but a nation that was judged. Israel was both blessed by God, but also went into rebellion and came under the chastening rod of Christ. And that's not through yet. All right, chapter 17. Numbers, chapter number 17. And uh, look at verse uh, 6. Uh, verse 5. Number 17, 5. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom. And I will make this cease from me. Look at this one, folks. Wow. The what? Murmurings. murmurings. What did we preach about this morning? Murmurings. murmurings. See how that murmur is connected uh, in a second to the almond tree? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, he says, uh, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel. So notice the context is the nation of Israel, uh, doctrinally speaking, whereby they murmur against you. And that's Israel's rebellion was a was a murmuring heart. It was the was the, the nation of Israel's problem. Is they were rebellious because they were murmurers, complainers, which led to disputing, which leads to rebellion. Okay, now verse 6. And Moses spake of the children of Israel, and of every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece. For each prince, one according to their fathers, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. Now what they wanted was... Who gets to be the big shot? Who gets to be the the high priest uh, tribe, right? Yeah. Murmurings. We want to be number one. Remember what murmuring is? Murmuring is sometimes uh, uh, you not getting what somebody else want, what somebody else has, and you wanting what they have. Never being satisfied, never thankful with what you have, right? And always want. So that's what this whole thing's about. So God's going to do a little contest with these twelve tribes, and in particular the head of each tribe, and whichever one's uh, rod that they bring blossoms, that's the nation, or that's the tribe that God's going to uh, prove to be the, the, the Levitical priesthood, if it, as it were, all right? The, 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 the tribe of the priests, okay? Verse 7, Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, notice, the rod of Aaron, for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yield what? Oh. So what do we have? An almond tree. Yeah. Aaron's rod turned into an almond tree. And so what you see here is that if God uses the rod of correction, when he uses the rod of correction, he's using the almond tree rod. Okay? He's saying, I have blessed you, the nation of Israel, with great blessing, spiritual and physical blessing. And yet, because of your rebellion, your murmuring, I'm going to chasten you with the rod that has blossomed and budded like you have, right? And why is he going to do that? Because he's now become the high priest for us. Okay. See how that thing works? <clears throat> Jesus Christ, now he's of the tribe of Judah, but he's the high priest right. out of Judah. Right. And as the high priest out of Judah, he's going to use the chastening almond rod to bring people into under subject, under rules, as it were, okay? Okay. So if you come under uh, uh, God's rule, you'll be blessed, right? right? If you come under, if you submit yourself under God's rule, you're blessed. If you don't submit yourself, it's going to hurt. That's the whole idea. And it's going to hurt because God's going to use that almond rod, which is a twisted, crooked rod 
that God has to make straight. Remember what um, John the Baptist said? Yeah. Prepare the way the Lord has gone before. Make the crooked ways straight. Yeah. He's going to make the crooked ways straight. What's the crooked ways? The crooked ways of Israel. Right. He's going to make them straight. Why? Because the almond tree is a crooked tree that pictures the nation of Israel. And only God can make a crooked tree like Israel become straight. Only God can take a crooked rod and make it straight and then make it blossom as a result. And again, if you want to make it apply to yourself, you were that way. You were rebellious. You were crooked. You were perverse. You were twisted and all bent out of shape. And when God saved you, he made you straight. Amen. And then he blessed you like an almond tree would be blessed. Amen? Amen. That's the whole idea. In other words, if you're not straight, you're crooked. How about that on a pride t-shirt? If you're not straight, you're crooked. All right. Look at Exodus chapter 7. Exodus 7. See, there's a lot more in the Bible about these names and these cities and these events. You know, why do I care that about this man who went and spied, uh, turned on his country, what a traitor he was, and that he named this new city? What are these minor details in the Bible about? It's to expose, uh, expose a greater and deeper truth. Right. Amen. Sometimes you just can't get to that uh, in the morning service. You've got to kind of set it aside for some other time. All right, Exodus chapter 7, and look at verse 12. Well, we can look at verse. We can look at verse eight. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, uh, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Notice that he's going to take a rod that eventually becomes an almond rod, right? Eventually, Aaron's rod becomes an almond rod. But he says, This rod that's going to become an almond rod is going to become a serpent first. All right. Now look. It shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. So you've got crooked serpents here, both for Aaron and for the magicians. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he, just like his rod budded above all the other rods, this rod became the dominant serpent, the dominant rod that ate up all the other rods, okay? They cast every man his rod, and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So Aaron's rod buds into an almond tree, but before it buds into an almond tree, it was turned into a righteous, crooked snake. Now think about this. Remember I said to you this morning, why is this serpent as harmless as doves, right? In other words, there are righteous serpents in the world. You and I are to be righteous serpents. You and I are to be crooked for Christ's sake, as it were, right? In other words, you get the idea, is that sometimes you've got to take the enemy's tactics and reverse and use it on them. So the Lord knew that these magicians could cast down rods and turn them into serpents. He knew that. So he said, no big deal. You're going to do it. I'm going to do it. But I'm going to show you which one is righteous in the act of being crooked. The Lord's. And that's why I say sometimes when it comes to being American, you can use the liberty that God has given you to your advantage and not feel guilty about it. Uh, you can use the spy Rahab who lied to protect her, fa her family and herself. You can use David, who, when he was on the run from Saul, lies. He said, there's a step between me and death, and he lied three times and did not get rebuked for it. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a time and a place where God will allow you to deceive or beguile the world because it's, it matches scripturally both your biblical liberties and your religious liberties and your American liberties. All right? So here you have an, a, a, a thing that is. Uh, uh, a almond rod, eventually, that was first turned into a righteous, crooked snake. Now, what is that picture in regards to the nation of Israel? Well, as it pertains to the nation of Israel, it shows how that a righteous Jewish nation, Israel, would eventually become a crooked nation. In other words, they started off right. They started off right. 
But let me ask you a question. Who did God choose to start the nation of Israel? The Jews. What one person did God change his name to become Israel? Jacob. Jacob. That's right. Jacob's name was turned from Jacob to Israel by the Lord. Now let me ask you a question. What kind of man was Jacob? He was a supplanter. He was a crooked man. He was a deceiver. And yet that's the one that God chose. It's like God chose the rod to turn into a serpent to swallow the other serpents up. And then eventually a lot of things to blossom in blood, a bud. God chose Jacob, a crooked supplanter, a snake in the grass, if you will, to form or to become what would be the 12 tribes of Israel that would blossom and flourish as a branch. But how did it start? It started with a crooked man. Uh, not only that, not only that, but out of the nation of Israel, who would come but Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ would come out of the nation of Israel. In other words, Jesus Christ chose to come out of a crooked nation. He came out of the loins of a crooked man, Jacob, a supplanter. You know why that is? Because one day, Jesus Christ was going to die on a cross. A wooden cross, as it were. Okay? Now, think about it. When the Bible says that Christ is going to come back in the night, how does the Bible say he's going to come back? Like a thief in the night. Like a crook. Oh, crooked. He's going to come back like a crook, robbing, taking out of the world something that belongs to the world in the sense of you live here. God's going to steal you out as a thief in the night, as a crook. Let me ask you a question. When they put him up on that tree there, who did he hang between? Two thieves. Then the Bible says he was numbered with the transgressors. Now, he wasn't a sinner. We know that. But what did the Bible say? He became what? Sin for us. He knew no sin. Some have speculated, and I would give them more to their argument here, that when Christ died on the cross, some have speculated that as Christ died on the cross, his body literally turned into that of a serpent. He literally became sin on the cross for us. Some have speculated that. I don't necessarily buy into it, but what I'll say is, if you want to make that so, you could use this here and show how that a rod can become a snake to be able to bless. God could have been come sin on the cross of Calvary. He could have been turned into a snake like Aaron's rod was. And as a result of that, we are blessed with spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. But the whole idea is that Christ came out of a crooked nation, out of uh, Israel, and he became a crook, as it were, by dying on the cross and taking our sins upon himself. Now look, go back to the book of Judges real quick. Go back to the book of Judges. Okay, there's always a little bit of truth, but sometimes you can take truth too far, right? So to say that Christ literally became a serpent on the cross might be to stretch the truth a little bit, okay? It might be. But you can get the tight picture anyway. All right, Judges 1, 23. Did he say I am a worm? He says I am a worm and no man. Yeah, he did say that. Yeah, he did say that. Wow. Should I wait? No, you can ask a question. Um, but just like guys were saying, the soul's cut from the, the flesh, mm -hmm. wouldn't that still be the situation with Christ where the flesh wouldn't be touching his soul? So, he, so they, could the worm be what? Inside? Well, his, obviously his soul left his body when he died. Right. But so, he, when, so when his soul left his when his soul left the body, and uh, you start going into what happened when he went to hell. Some say that he burned three days and three nights. I don't believe that Christ burned for three days and three nights. I do believe that he went down to the heart of the earth. So if his soul became if his soul became a serpent, it would have become a serpent in the soul form. That's what I'm saying. Because the Bible says that um, uh, he says uh, lose he loses his own soul. When it says in Mark 9 that losing his own soul, that's to lose the shape of the soul. Right. To become like your father the devil, which was a serpent. A worm. So if Christ became a servant at any time, it would have been in soul when he went down, not the physical thing on the cross. Correct. Yeah. 
All right, now, uh, are you in Judges chapter 1? All right, verse 22. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against, notice, Bethel. And the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph sent to describe Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. Now here's, how, here's where you get the dual application again. What is Bethel, what's the, what does the name Bethel mean? Of right God. Of huh? God. Of God. So, something like that. Yeah. It's, it's house of, uh, the house of bread, right? House of, or house of God. Sorry, it means the house of God, right? Yeah. Bethlehem means the house of bread. But uh, Bethel means the house of God. Before, it was a crooked and, and then crooked and perverse. That was the name of it before, the city before. Was crooked and perverse, lose. Well, it was changed to Bethel, which means the house of God. Does anybody know who changed the name from Lewis to Bethel? Would it have been Jacob? Who it was Jacob. Oh, yeah. Because then he would turn back to Bethel. Oh, yeah. So he, he, Isn't that he, cool? Yeah. Is that what we had to Yeah, we're going to go there in a second. Okay. Jacob changed the name from Luz yep. to Bethel because he knew that God was there. Yep. So a crooked and perverse man who was a deceiver and a supplanter oh, wow. had a change of heart, as it were, and became the house of God. Became the house of God. And isn't that Jacob always dealt right the rest of his life? We know that. Right. right? But that's how it was all started was through him. So here you have a crooked and perverse uh, city that was changed to Bethel. And uh, the connection again is to Jacob and Israel. So let's go to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. Genesis 28. Remember, God changed Jacob's name. Right. God changed. And as Israel, it means a uh, prince with God. Prince with God is what uh, Israel means. A prince with God. So are we, we're changed. Then we yeah. get saved. Yeah, absolutely. You go right. from being so a crooked, crooked and perverse to, to being, uh, to being right. a house of God because right. God dwells in you. Right. That's the spiritual application right. of that right there. That's right. Amen. You're getting it. I like it. You're getting it. <laughs> it's good when you get it. Amen. All right, Genesis 28, look at verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lied upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took the other stones in that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angel of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, uh, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad uh, to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. And will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee. And Jacob, Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And um, I knew it not. Um, and he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but, there it is, the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set up for a pillar and poured upon it, uh, poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place what? Definitely. But the name of that city was called what? Lose. You see why it's important to know these names yeah, in the Bible? Yeah, you're right. yeah. Jacob, whose name is eventually turned from Jacob to Israel, is the very man who changed the name of Luz, crooked and perverse, twisted out of the way, to the house of God. God chose a, chose a crooked, perverse man to change the name of the city to the house of God. Why? Because out of Jacob was going to come Christ. Out of the nation of Israel was going to come Jesus Christ. And out of him, he was going to make unto us a spiritual household. Remember reading that Bible over there? You're a spiritual household of believers now, right? We came out of that. We came out of Luz and into Bethel like Jacob went into Luz, crooked and perverse, and he came out the house of God, as it were. He had a great transformation that night. And that Bible says that right there was the gate, the gate of heaven. That Bible says that right there is where the ladder came down. You remember that in the New Testament, I think it's in the book of John, 
He says at some point you're going to see um, angels descending and ascending from out of the earth, out of heaven to earth. Well, that's a type picture. The ladder there is a picture of Jesus Christ. Okay. The ladder is Jesus Christ there in, in illustration or in picture form. Okay. When Christ came to earth, he was that ladder manifested in the flesh. Yeah, and he's showing them he confirmed the covenant that he made with Jacob and the latter dream, he confirmed that covenant, Romans says in Galatians says, he confirmed that covenant with the nation of Israel. And he said, you'll see the angels ascending and descending to earth. How are they getting there? On Christ. That's how. How do we get to heaven? On Christ. On Christ. We go up on Christ on the ladder. That's our covenant. It changed a little bit from my Israeli covenant to a new covenant, as it were. But nevertheless, the, the ladder stays the same. The ladder is Christ, yeah. okay? And, uh, and it all took place in this, in this crooked and perverse land that becomes, remember, that this land that's called Luz, uh, that land that I was saying, I'm going to give you this land. So that land is, so what, the reason why you have uh, judges there and they're going to describe and spy out Bethel is because that's their land. That's, that's their land there in Judges. That's supposed to be theirs. And, uh, and, and and so they go and find that land and take it back. That's what they do. You had your hand. I was just going to say, you know, in terms of the application, Jesus Christ is on the door. Yep. And we can say, yep. it is our gateway to heaven. Yeah, that's right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. And right there he said that the Lord was in that place. He says, this is uh, the house of God, the gate of heaven. So at the New Testament, he says, I am the door. And, yeah. he is our and he's, our, he's our way into heaven. That's right. And the death place, so when the Jews aren't hearing that, and I'm getting that, they had everything they needed to get it. Right? They had, they had Jacob. They had Jacob. They had the latter dream that they believed. All right? Now, I'm not done with this crooked business yet. Look at uh, Genesis 35. So the uh, Luz becomes Bethel, the house of bread, the house of God. But the original Luz was where Jacob turned aside when he was in distress. The reason why Jacob went to that place was why? He was on the run from his brother. Right. He had just stolen his brother's birthright. Right? right? Yeah. As a thief would, yeah. as a crook would, right. yeah. he deceived his father yeah. by putting on raiment that smelled and looked like Esau. Right. He took venison, or not venison, but he took other kind of meat there, I guess. And he brought it there, and Rebecca cooked it. Venison, his, his mother cooked it for him, and deceived. And so he's on the run. And while he's on the run, you know what he does? He turns aside to lose. Lose means turn aside. Why did he turn aside to some other place? Why did he turn aside to the land called lose? Because lose means turn aside. That's why. That's why. And so he's on the run as a thief who steals something and then runs from the law, which is Christ. All right, Genesis 35. And verse number one. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of thy brother, uh, from Esau, uh, from the face of Esau, thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress. You know what happens when you go that when you get in distress, you turn aside. Yeah. Yeah. And was with me in the way which I went. Notice how God was with him in the way. Even in the crooked and perverse way, God was there with him. Right. Amen. Wild, huh? Amen. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which are in their ears. Um, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. Notice he didn't get rid of them, he just hid them. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after uh, the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to where? Which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place of it El Bethel, that is God, the house of God. Because there God appeared unto him, and he when he fled from the face of uh, his brother. All right, now go to Genesis twenty-five. Genesis twenty-five. So 
Jake was on the run from his brother, and he goes to Luz, which later becomes Bethel. Okay? Now look at Genesis 25. And, um, let's see here. We're up. We're fine here. Okay, so there, verse number 27. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob saw pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. All right, so Esau is Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this birth this day uh, thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he sware unto him and sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage for lentils, and did eat and drink, and rose up and went his head away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So Esau who becomes Edom, becomes an enemy of the nation of Israel, right? It's weird. The one that's crooked and perverse becomes the one that God uses. Right. And the one that was a hunter, was a straight, was, you know, just a man of the field and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. He's the one that becomes uh, really the more crooked one in the, in the long run. Yeah. Now, notice there that it says Jacob dwelt in tents. Mm -hmm. Go with me to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. There it says dwelt in tents. Genesis chapter 9. And look at verse 27. Genesis 9, 27. God shall enlarge who? Jacob. And shall dwell where? In the towns of Shem. In the towns of Shem. Who's David? That's the Europeans. Yeah. Who's Shem? That's your Eastern Orientals. Right. Yeah. Jacob, the, the English variation, the English translation of the name Jacob is what? It's James. Right. An English king. Oh. The English form of Jacob is James. Right. King James was a European oh. from Japheth. Yeah. Yeah. People like to make fun of King James for being a crooked man. Mm -hmm. oh. A perverse man who liked, you know, finer clothes and they even accused him of being a sodomite. Can anything good come out of a King James? Yeah, well, can anything yeah. good come out of Jacob? The yeah. King James Bible did exactly. Yeah. Wow. Could God use a crooked and perverse man to bring about a straight thing? Yeah. Well, yeah. if God can take a snake and cast to the, or take a rod and cast to the ground and turn it into a snake and then turn it back into a rod and then make it blossom, I guess God could use if King yeah. James was a crooked man to use him to give us a straight Bible. Right. Yeah. A plain Bible, a plain Bible. The Bible says that Jacob dwelt in tents. In other words, Jacob is a picture of a of a of a European. A Jew who dwelt in tents is a type picture of the Japhethites who are going to dwell in the tents of Shem. We get in on the blessings of Shem. We get in on the blessings of Israel. So the Jew and the, the Jew and the and the and the American, as it were, the nation of Israel and America, they go hand in hand. They are a blessing one to another. Just like Jacob is Shem, Japheth is America. Let me ask you a question. How was America formed but by 13 rebellious colonies? And out of a crooked people, because when they landed here, they didn't give you religious freedom. They brought England with them. And you did not have religious liberty, religious freedom. It was still England's form of, of religious liberty, as it were. In other words, you either get in line with the, the Church of Rome, Church of England, or you get persecuted. Obadiah Holmes and so and those guys there, uh, John uh, uh, Clark over there in, in Rhode Island, and and uh, Roger Williams. It's because they didn't conform to the Church of England. They want religious liberty. So out of a crooked beginning comes a straight thing. Right. See how they, out of crooked man comes even your constitution. Yeah. See how that thing works out? Yeah. Jacob is so much a picture of America. Israel is so much a picture of America. It's ridiculous. 
Somebody had their hand up. Brother Jim? Right. I, I was just uh, going to say uh, the, the alleged, alleged document against him. Yes. Yeah. And that comes out 25 years after he's already dead. Right, right. And, and there's no contemporary uh, evidence. There you go. So it's all it's all slander. It's all hearsay. Yes, right. and, uh, and, and, and they'll say the same thing about the translators. They'll say the translators, some of the guys that worked on it, you know, guys are drunk, a guy committed adultery. You know, they, you know, they blasted these guys, you know, left and right. And let's just say it's all true. Did David not murder Uriah the Hittite? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. And that's called the short verses of David. Sure. So could God take a crooked thing and make yeah. it straight? Yeah. He did with the rod. Amen. He did with Jacob. He, he's going to do it with the nation of Israel. It's crooked and perverse, turned aside out of the way. He's going to make her straight once again. Amen. So he did with me. He did it with you. Amen. All right. Look at. Um, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. Go to Genesis thirty-two. Jacob dwelt in the tents there. Jacob dwells in the tents of Shem. We we dwell in we live under the umbrella. We live under the shadow of Jacob. We live under the shadow of those Jews there. Uh, we live under the protection, the, the sovereign protection, as it were, the tent, as it were, the thing that protects us and shelters us. We live in that shelter, that protection, so long as we abide Amen. by the King James Bible. Amen. This is our tent. Amen. This is the thing that covers us, that protects us, Amen. that shields us from the storms and the blasts of life. Amen. This book and this book alone. Amen. Whether it had a crooked beginning or not, I cannot say. I wasn't there. I had never met the man. I got as much reason to believe he was as straight as an arrow as as anybody. But for that matter, I never met I never met uh, Mussolini. I haven't met Putin. I haven't met Trump. But I haven't met Biden. So who knows who's who? That's right. All I know is I got a perfect Bible. Amen. And even even if he's even if he's not a saint, he's he's, he's a man like the rest of us. Right. He at least gave us the right book. Yeah. Yeah. We're also grafted in. Yeah, we are grafted in. And we're grafted in to the Jews. That's the, right. Uh, mm -hmm. Or to the gods. You're Jews. right. You're right. I mean, I even go so far as to say there's one body. I don't know how far I want to go with that, but I say there's one body there. He's got one fold, one shepherd. Uh, if he grabbed us in, he did a pretty mighty job of it Amen. as far as the nation of Israel goes. Yeah. All right, um, Genesis 32. Genesis 32. How about this for crooked? Lose. I don't know lose means crooked, turned aside, twisted, perverse, out of the way. How about this? Genesis chapter 32, 32. He says there, therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh to this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the in the sinew that shrank. When Je when Jacob was wrestling with the Lord here, God touched his thigh. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when the muscles shrink? You walk crooked. Yeah. <laughs> you're turned aside. You're turned out of the way. Yeah. It's too. The Bible is too perfect. It, it connects so many dots Amen. for it to be an imperfect book. Yeah. God chose Jacob, a crooked, twisted, dealing man, to turn his name to Israel. And the promise God touched that touches that man, so he now walks crooked. And then that man found the city that was called Luz, crooked and perverse, and gives it the name Bethel. And yet, in the book of Judges, which is all about how. Uh, it's a picture of how the, the church of God, the, the, the Laodicean church age, is going to become a crooked and perverse generation at the end. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how do you get around it? It's all connected. Amen. The Lord physically caused Jacob to walk crooked when he touched the hollow of the star. Right. Go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. This is the last one. Deuteronomy 32. The almond tree is a tree that pictures the nation of Israel. The almond tree is also a, a thing that pictures the Lord Jesus Christ himself. For that matter, the vine tree. The vine tree is also a pretty you know, twisted tree. The vine tree is both a picture of Christ and the nation of Israel. The almond tree is both a picture of Christ and the nation of Israel. The apple tree is a picture of Christ and the nation of Israel. The olive tree is both a picture of Christ and the picture of, of, of Israel. The cedar tree is a picture of uh, of Israel and the Antichrist. Uh, the oak tree is a picture both of Israel and the Antichrist. 
Where did he hide, where did Jacob hide that stuff under an oak tree? Where did you find uh, where did you find um, Saul always sitting under an oak tree? So as much as the almond tree pictures both Christ and Israel, and the vine tree pictures both Christ and Israel, the oak tree pictures both the Antichrist and Israel, the cedar tree pictures both Israel and the Antichrist, and the bay tree pictures both the Antichrist and the nation of Israel. Wow. You ever read that verse where it says, um, uh, I saw men walking like trees? Yes. God uses trees, it's over there in Mark somewhere, uh, God uses trees to illustrate um, a, a, a spiritual truth, wow. right? And so if God has his tree that matches the nation of Israel, God's also going to build into the scripture a perverse, a crooked tree, right. a twisted tree, or even a strong tree that pictures the nation of Israel. Uh, the fig tree also pictures uh, uh, self-righteousness and the nation of Israel. Yeah. The fig tree pictures, remember over there, he says that he came along and he found a fig tree with no fruit on it? Yeah. That pictures the nation of Israel. The fig tree pictures the nation of Israel. Yeah. All right, uh, Deuteronomy 32. This is just about the almond tree because, after all, we're in Judges and the land of Luz, which had almond trees in it. Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. Now remember that God touched Jacob's thigh in Deuteronomy or in Genesis 32. Okay? Now we are in Deuteron Deuteronomy 32, and look at verse 5. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. There's a pronouncement of God's judgment upon the nation of Israel when they turned after false gods and went out of the way and turned their back on God, Jehovah. They are a crooked and perverse, notice what it says, generation. That crooked and perverse generation there ends up becoming the generation that crucifies Christ. Remember what it says over there? Let his blood be upon our people and his people. Or our, you know, our um, uh, this people and our children's people, all that kind of stuff. Uh, one place he says, uh, "Heaven, not, heaven, and earth shall pass away." But this generation, one time he says, "This generation." Uh, in Proverbs he says, "There's a generation whose teens are like knives." It's a crooked and perverse generation. It goes from the time of Jacob all the way fast forward, all the way to the time when they crucified Christ. And if he became anything on the cross, he became sin for us. And he says he, he came to seek and to save that which was lost, right. that which was turned aside, that which was turned out of the way. He became a curse for us. Who no, no, who, you know, he didn't deserve it, but he became a curse for us. Amen. He became, as it were, a crooked serpent on the cross of Calvary. Uh, yeah. This crooked and perverse generation. And that now, in the practical spiritual application, is where we were this morning in Philippians chapter 2. He says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. He says, um, that, you may be, that you may be blameless and harmless. Uh, so the sons of God, in the midst of a crooked and perverse, there it says, nation. God changes it from generation, Israel, to nation. That's because at the time, it was referring to the Romans. That was the nation in charge at that time. But, Maybe they are still in charge today, the Pope at Rome. Maybe Rome, maybe Rome is in power still. So not a whole lot has changed since that time. But we are to live as lights, shining lights, holding forth the word of life. We are to live as being a straight rod in the midst of an almond tree type nation, as it were. Heavenly Father, pray God you'd sing some of this home. Uh, Lord, looking at types and similes and, and pictures and going back to the Old Testament and drawing practical spiritual application to the New Testament, Lord, and kind of ties into this morning's service, uh, Lord, that we might do 